so. Yeah, I know. That's <laughs> like, I can't. We good? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank good you for afternoon. joining us. So my name is Jennifer Summers. I'm the Program Development Specialist with the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. And before I introduce our speakers today, I would like to thank you again for coming. Um, you are here for uh, the, the seminar series, which is titled The Science and Culture of Black Bears, Human Perspectives on a Large Carnivore. This is the um, uh, seminar series. There are six total talks in this series, so this is the second. Um, so I'd like you to pay attention to these dates coming up. So next week we have um, her uh, tribal name is Wabishka Benisque is coming, and she is going to be talking about the cultural significance of black bears to the An Anishinaabe people. Um, so that's going to be a really interesting talk. So please, uh, please come and, and participate in that. And then we have three other talks um, coming or from March 2nd through March 16th, and they're all going to be on Thursdays at 4 p.m. in this room. Um, with the exception of the one on March 9th, that one will be virtual, but we will be doing a watch party in this room as well. And they're all about bears, and they're all going to be good. So please come back. <laughs> So I'd like to say thank you to everybody who helped coordinate this seminar series. Um, this was co-organized with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, um, so I'd like to thank them. And I'd also like to thank the uh, College of Natural Resources. This is a seminar series that we put on in cooperation with them every year. And then also UW Extension. So the director, Scott Hinkstrom <coughs> of the Wisconsin Center for Wildlife, is an extension specialist, so by extension, much of what we do is an extension um, of, of um, uh, activity. <laughs> so thank you to everybody who has helped us put this series together. And finally, this is uh, something we like to do to acknowledge the tribes in our area. We recognize the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point occupies lands of the Ho-Chunk and Menominee people. Please take a moment to acknowledge and honor the ancestral Ho-Chunk and Menominee land and the sacred land of all indigenous peoples. And thank you to our YouTube audience for your patience, and you probably couldn't hear me there. So, so now I'm going to pass this off to Katie Sartini, um, who's Associate Professor of Wildlife here at UWSP, and she is going to introduce our speakers today. All right, everyone, welcome. We have two excellent speakers here today from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. We have Randy Johnson here, who is the large carnivore specialist for the department. He's stationed out of the Rhinelander office and is responsible for the management efforts related to wolves, black bears, and the occasional, you said occasional, the occasional cougar, cougar, right? Yeah. Um, just the occasional <laughs> cougar uh, for, uh, for Randy. Um, outside of work, he enjoys a variety of pursuits, including hunting, <clears throat> fishing, and exploring the Northwoods. Um, and I was talking to Randy just a second ago about what he thinks his job is. He's apparently um, unsure of what he's actually doing, so he's going to be uh, telling us a little bit about that today. Um, and then he, we also have here with us Brad Cooley, who is a pointer. He graduated from um, UWSP here in 2001 and seems to remember this room in particular. Um, he started uh, right away, uh, or almost right away at least, uh, at the department and has been working there um, pretty much since he graduated. He started then in 2007 within the department as the wildlife damage specialist and is responsible for for the Wildlife Damage Abatement and Claims Program, among many other responsibilities at the department. So we invited both uh, Randy and Brad here today to share a specific, specifically with you all how we manage bears here in Wisconsin. And we've got two different perspectives, but we brought them in today intentionally at the same time because they both have a related story to tell about how we manage an animal like a bear here in the state. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to hand this to Brad, and then I'm going to sit down and let them talk to us about bears. <clears throat> Sounds good. Can everybody hear me okay? Good to go? Okay. Yeah, it was kind of funny. We were joking. So I work with black bears, wolves, and the occasional cougar in the state, and I've yet to come up with a concise summary or description of what that actually means, but I'm going to keep working on that. But one thing I do know is I'm really busy, it seems like, so I, don't know, I must be doing something. We're going to chat about black bears. I'm going to stand over here so I can see the screen a little easier. Um, yeah, I'm going to start off this kind of like three-part uh, presentation. First, with kind of an overview of black bears in the state. What's the population look like? Uh, some of the individual, you know, the biology 
a little bit of that, and then turn it towards our management program in the state. Uh, and I'll kind of take one side of that, which revolves around our hunting season, some of the, uh, the thought process behind that and how that comes together. Uh, and then I'll hand it over to Brad to get into the, the conflict side of things. So without further ado, Perfect, even better. Um, yeah, so we'll start with a little bit of biology. The first thing is black bears are widespread in the state. We have a, a very healthy population in the state. Our population models are currently uh, estimating around 25,000 animals in the state. It's one of the biggest black bear populations in the lower 48 states. Um, they're, they're much more common than they were you know, 30 years ago. Um, so. Just for some perspective, uh, it's a healthy population. You can see the map on the left. Uh, the darker colors are where bears are generally more abundant. Um, so you can see, you know, certainly more abundant in the north, uh, the central, uh, or the forested central areas of the state. But we also see a, a pattern uh, that continues. But over the last few decades, bears have, the bear population has expanded southward in the state. And you can kind of see that reflected there. Um, in fact, these, these three or four counties down here where it says not present probably should even be updated to transient. Uh, just in the last couple of years, we've had individual bears pop up <clears throat> in some of those areas. And it's a pattern we expect to continue. Um, this map shows uh, basically estimates of suitable habitat, more specifically occupancy probabilities, areas of the state where we uh, expect there can be some likelihood of bears uh, taking up residence. And, You'll notice a lot of the colors kind of match, right? A lot of the central forested areas, the northern forested areas. But there's some other pockets in the south, southeast, the driftless, where there's a decent likelihood bears could take up residence, um, at least based on this analysis, um, that they're maybe not there yet. So again, expect to see that pattern continue. <clears throat> um, individual bears, they cover a good bit of ground. Um, it can be really variable, past research here in the state has shown the, the females, the sows are seven square miles, the males, um, you know, 36 square miles, but th it can be really variable. Um, one pattern you tend to see is the males encompass several females. Um, and again, it, it's driven largely by food availability, resources, things like that. Different areas of the state, they can cover more ground, but um, generally speaking, they, they cover a, a sizable uh, territory. Uh, the, individ the, the younger bears, the, the, the yearlings, the two-year-olds, um, you know, they can also disperse long distances. And that comes back to what I mentioned earlier. They can, individual bears can pop up really anywhere in the state. Um, and, and they tend to do so every spring in the south, especially. Um, black bears can get really big, but most are not. When you think of a bear, it's very easy to, to picture you know, a large bear. It's kind of what you see on TV, right? Um, but the reality is most bears are, are not uh, that big. Uh, put it into perspective, the adult sows, the females, you know, 100 to 300 pounds, something like that. The males, again, are generally bigger, um, anywhere in that 100 to 500 plus pound range. They can get bigger. Um, in fact, Wisconsin is home to some of the biggest black bears in the country. Um, the one on the screen, uh, all reports suggested about just shy of 800 pounds. I mean, that's a big bear. Um, and we, we get bears harvested in the state every year that are five, six, even 700 pounds. But, you know, the average bear, if you pluck it off the landscape, it's going to be closer to that 150 to 200 pound range. But again, a lot of variation in individuals. And it can even vary from year to year. A bear can be uh, smaller than it was the previous year just based on that, that uh, pattern of denning up for the winter, using up those fat resources and going into the next year, and they've got to put those, those uh, fat layers back on. Which leads me into this. What are these bears eating? <clears throat> uh, they are omnivores. So they're, they're eating just about everything out there. Uh, and generally speaking, their diet follows the seasons, right? So when they're coming out of that hibernation uh, in the early spring, you know, they're looking for anything that's greening up. The grasses that are greening up, um, buds on trees, things like that. Uh, you know, those juicy, fresh greens. Um, certainly carcasses, if they can find those from winter killed deer, anything that's been covered and buried in the snow, uh, that's certainly on the menu. As you get later into the spring, um, whitetail fawns, definitely on the menu. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more of that in a second. 
And then, you know, things like insect colonies, nuts and berries as you get into the summer and, and into the fall, you know, all of these different food sources. This is kind of the natural menu, if you will. And you can see how there's kind of a pattern through time. Uh, and it can vary, right? Especially with the, the, the nuts and berries, that later season food availability can, can vary from year to year. And that can have real impacts on bear reproduction, bear size, all those things uh, in a given year. Whoops. So those are kind of the natural food sources, but there's quite a few uh, human related food sources as well. Right? That can be anything from your bird feeders, garbage, bear baits, agricultural fields. We'll get into some of that more in Brad's stuff. But um, there's, there's quite a bit of human food out there. And, and bears are very good at taking advantage of that. Uh, in some cases, other cases, they, they avoid it. Um, but one thing holds true in all of this is bears have an excellent memory. When they find a food source, they lock it in. Whether it's a human food source or a natural food source, they'll come back to it. And, and that's important, especially when we talk about trying to avoid some of the, the, the conflict with bears in trash cans and that type of thing, uh, which again, I'll let Brett speak more to. Uh, ecological role. Um, there's a lot going on here. These are, as the title of our talk suggests, uh, one of the biggest animals in our state. And, and they, they play a lot of different roles out there. Um, you know, they're eating all these different fruits and berries and, and, and by consuming all of that and covering all of this ground, they're uh, a really important and efficient uh, seed disperser. There's been some interesting research on this, especially out west, just how many, uh, how they can influence uh, plant diversity in a given area just by carrying all these seeds around and, and uh, expelling them out. Uh, nutrient cycling, so as they're looking for bug colonies or flipping things over to try to search for food in, in all these different situations. Uh, they can break down logs, for example, all kinds of different ways to help uh, recycle these nutrients in the forest. <clears throat> Opportunistic predators, I mentioned it earlier, bears are generally, they're certainly capable of uh, consuming whitetail fawns and some of them are very, very good at it. Um, but generally speaking, it's opportunistic. Um, you know, that first 30 days of life for a whitetail fawn, you know, they're, they're well, even more so the first couple of weeks, they're not very mobile. Bear stumbles upon them, they're gonna nab them. But once they start getting past that 30 days, they're more mobile, bears are not gonna spend a bunch of time chasing them down. Will they in some cases? Sure. But generally speaking, it's, it's a window. And again, it's kind of part of that natural cycle uh, of the bear's diet. There's a window there where you've got fawns available, they take advantage of them for a, for a period, and then kind of move on. Culturally important too. Um, there's a whole presentation on this uh, coming up next week, two weeks, next week, yeah. So that'll be uh, very interesting, but I mean, whether you're, you're looking at the, the tribal perspective or you know the, the Northwoods perspective, right? I mean, cabins are decorated with black bears. There's all kinds of uh, affiliation with black bears. Uh, in addition to that, um, in, especially in Wisconsin, they're viewed as a, 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 a big game animal. Right, a very desirable species to hunt and pursue and that generates an entire culture as well. So for a lot of different uh, reasons or perspectives, bears are very culturally important too. I think this is reflected in some public attitudes work. Uh, the Wisconsin DNR did, uh, what is that, five years ago now? Um, conducted some, some scientific surveys, so sending out random samples uh, to residents of the state and asking all kinds of different questions, but. Um, one of the main themes of those results was that here in the state, residents really like bears. They enjoy high public support. Um, so you can see some of the results there. 81% agreed they deserve our appreciation. Uh, over half expressed willingness to live near bears. Uh, agreed they don't necessarily pose a danger. So, you know, some of these measures, different ways of measuring the same thing, right? People uh, are willing to live near bears. And more so, they're willing to tolerate some of the negatives that come with bears, right? Whether that's getting in your trash, uh, you know, the, the, there is, you know, like I said, some, some level of danger to, um, you know, the, the, the human safety concern, pet concerns, things like that. But for the most part, people are willing to, to uh, take these precautions uh, and, and live with bears. And they appreciate the chance to do it. <clears throat> 
Okay, shifting gears a little bit to the management program in the state. Um, so the DNR, we're an, uh, an executive agency, right? We've got uh, authority vested in the agency through the legislature, and this has real impacts on the bear program. Um, a lot of our hunting season, the application process, as well as the conflict program is outlined in state law, and the DNR is the agency then that implements that. And so within that space, we've got some guidelines, right? We have a black bear management plan that was put together, uh, reviewed and updated um, a few years ago, 2019, and uh, largely informed uh, by our black bear advisory committee. So we have in the state a black bear advisory committee that's made up by DNR staff, stakeholder groups, we have tribal representation, we have other government agencies on here. And this group uh, gets together to review the program, review the data, make recommendations, provide input, all of these things. Um, it's one of the key ways we you know, involve the public as well as different stakeholders in our management program. So I'm not gonna read the program goal, but basically it lays out, hey, let's, let's facilitate the benefits and let's minimize the negatives, all while making sure the bear population stays healthy. That document, by the way, is on the DNR website. It's free to look at, free to, to view. It's got a lot of good information on the biology, the ecology, um, the history of bears in the state, as well as obviously uh, our, our management program. <clears throat> So a lot of it boils down to this idea, right? Trying to balance out these different objectives. Uh, and these are the two we're gonna focus on today. The, the, the black bear population in the state is primarily managed through these annual hunting seasons, as well as site-specific conflict abatement. And I have them on a scale, right? Because there, there's some balancing that needs to be done here. If on one hand, all we cared about was the, the hunting season, we could manage for a lot of bears and we could do that. If you did so, obviously that might have some negative impacts on the other end of the spectrum, and vice versa. So a lot of it is working together to try to find this balance. And it can vary depending on where you're at in the state, right? So I'll focus for a little bit on the, the bear season. Um, regulated harvest, it's the primary tool to manage the bear population in the state uh, with respect to abundance, right? Uh, all of that is in support of trying to achieve our management objectives. And so we can increase harvest in certain areas, we can decrease harvest in certain areas, we can maintain harvest uh, as a tool to affect bear population abundance in those different areas. <clears throat> um, a lot of this again is, is laid out in state statute as far as the hunting season, the methods and things like that. But just for a little bit of background, zone specific harvest targets, meaning different parts of the state get different levels of harvest and that can vary from year to year depending on what our objectives are. A limited number of licenses, so if a hunter wants to go bear hunting, they've got to put in for a license lottery, um, and it can take anywhere between one year all the way up to currently 12 years to draw a license. And so uh, hopefully that's communicating that it's, it's a well-regulated season. There's a lot of thought and, and regulation that goes into this season. Uh, methods include hunting with, uh, hunting with dogs as well as the aid of bait. That's probably 99% of our harvest comes through those two uh, methods. And we see uh, what that graph on the left is showing is record high interest. The interest in bear hunting in the state uh, increases year after year. We've got currently about 140,000 people applying or that applied last year for a, either a preference point or a bear license. And so the reason I point that out is, is generally speaking, in the, in the hunting world, you see interest and participation declining. And interestingly enough, with the bear world, it's the opposite. And there's a lot of reasons behind that. We'll save those for another day. Um, so management program, as it relates to the hunting season, um, there's kind of an annual cycle that we follow, right? We have the fall bear hunt, which I kind of just described. What happens after that? Well, every bear that's harvested legally has to be re uh, registered, so we get data on locations and methods and effort and all those things. Uh, they submit tooth samples. From that tooth, we can get an age, as well as um, currently we're doing some DNA and genetics work. So we get a bunch of information from the harvest to make sure we know, you know what all that looks like, as well as hunter surveys. We get information from the hunters. 
where did you hunt? What was the level of effort? Uh, all those other questions to inform uh, future decisions. A lot of the biological information goes into our population models. This is what allows us to estimate how many bears are out there. And not only that, but what is the trend of that population? Are we having less bears year after year, more bears, or is it staying about the same? And how does that relate to uh, our objectives? From that, our bear advisory committee gets together, usually in the fall, to review this data, uh, review the, the population estimates, as well as you know, our conflict levels, all these different considerations. And from that, try to develop some initial uh, harvest targets or initial quotas. Uh, those then get taken to the DNR. We go through our leadership process, and eventually uh, those recommendations are presented to the Natural Resources Board in the state for approval. Uh, once approved, then we're right back to having that season, awarding the licenses, and people make their plans and, and go on to bear hunt. Um, and then the, the final point I'll make is, again, I've talked to it here, the, the management zones. We have six different management zones in the state, A, B, C, D, E, and F. <laughs> And, you know, again, that allows a regional approach. All of these conversations happen at the regional uh, level. Uh, and you can see how this over here is, you know, a reflection of land cover, forest. You can see how the boundaries kind of follow that, as well as over here, cropland. So again, the management objectives and the management approach changes a little bit depending on where you're at in the state. So I've talked about the left side of that, and this is where I hand it over to Brad, talk about the right. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure Good to be here. Um, like uh, Katie had said, I'm a point grad, graduated in 2001, so it's uh, great to be back in this room where I sat in your chairs for a long time. So um, <laughs> five years, as a matter of fact, so it's a five-year plan. But, um, yeah, great to be back. So I handle uh, the Wildlife Conflict Program for the DNR, so I, I have probably the best job in DNR, I think. So I get to deal with a whole variety of species, you know, whether it's sandhill cranes, or, or whether it's bats, or whether it's feral pigs, um, bear, deer, elk, turkey, geese. I get to deal with a wide variety of species, so that's why I think it's the best job. So, um, but obviously, as Randy alluded to, um, you know, bear. Bear is a significant portion of my job, and, and um, one of the big species that I deal with. Um, as he said, you know, quota setting, you know, the bear population is primarily managed through hunting, but um, you know, we have these site-specific conflicts that do uh, happen, and we need to address those as well. So that's my job, is to um, you know, deal, deal with farmers or deal with homeowners, deal with people that are having those conflicts. Um, our program, the Bear Management Program, is a partnership. It's not just DNR out there. We do contract with USDA Wildlife Services. For those folks that aren't familiar with Wildlife Services, they're a, a branch of the federal agency, and their, their job is, is specific to conflict management, um, you know, whether it's game or, or uh, migratory birds. Um, they specialize in conflict management for wildlife species. So we partner with Wildlife Services to assist the department in, in conflict response for bear. Um, they maintain a 1-800 toll-free number, so anybody in the state that's having a conflict, we direct them to Wildlife Services. Um, and we, they get probably seven, 800 calls a year about bear conflicts. Um, when those calls come in, uh, they're separated and, and we manage them Two, two different ways or, or categorize them two different ways. One is nuisance conflicts. And nuisance conflicts is, you know, can be, you know, garbage cans, bird feeders, um, you know, just those general bear conflicts you're thinking about. It can be bear in urban areas. Um, you know, those folks that were, um, remember last year, uh, last spring and, and early summer, we had some bear in Washington and, and you know, um, um, Oconomowoc and, and you know some of those southeast communities down there and it's it's a big deal you know you get a bear up in Hayward or a bear up in Monaco not such a big deal they're used to dealing with them but you get something down south it's it's a big deal and, and attracts a lot of attention but they're separated a nuisance and then the other category is agriculture uh, we have the wildlife damage abatement and claims program which I'll talk about in a minute and that program is is created by the state legislature and it's specific to commercial agricultural crops and it provides abatement assistance and compensation for those bear damages. Uh, so nuisance conflicts, uh, these are some of the common nuisance conflicts you're gonna see. Uh, garbage cans, grills, uh, bird feeders, uh, those are, are the primary ones. But also we do have conflicts that, that are more severe where you know, bears enter dwellings. Um, last year we had a, a case where 
Um, some bear were eating at a bird feeder up in Taylor County. The woman opened the window to yell at the bear to, to get him away from the bird feeder. Normally a bear would, would turn and run the other way. This bear turned and came right through the window into the house. Um, they ended up actually killing the bear inside the house because it, it came in. But um, that's, that's pretty rare. That doesn't happen very often, but those are the type of conflicts that, that do happen in the state. So when a call comes in, um, we have a, a bear response guideline document. Um, and we, we, we group or we triage these calls and we have these different response levels. And it's based off of you know, how severe that, that complaint is. Um, you know, response level critical, that's when a bear has attacked or injured a person. Very rare, um, happens here and there, but, but pretty, pretty um, rare situation where somebody's attacked or injured. A lot of times if there is, it's, it's because there's some type of attractant there. Um, the, the cases that I recall, it's, it's usually bird feeder type incidents or it's uh, pet dogs, um, you know, going out, engaging with a bear and then that homer, homeowner trying to intervene between the dog and the bear. Um, so it doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. Uh, response level one, immediate threat to human health and safety. And, and our response to these, um, to these uh, um, incidents, you know, is going to vary based off of how, how severe it is. You know, these level criticals, these level ones, sometimes level twos, you know, require, uh, typically require immediate site visit, you know, for us intervening and, and taking some type of management action. Where we get into some of these other levels, you know, the level two where a bear has, um, you know, a situation where a bear uh, or the conflict has the potential to escalate into a human health and safety situation, or the three or fours where there's minor property damage and, and four where it's a bear just exhibiting normal behavior, you know, we can ultimately or, or most cases, um, you know, um, respond to that complaint with, with education and, and providing information to those callers. You know, like I said, response level four, you know, for a lot of folks in northern Wisconsin, seeing a bear is not a big deal. But like I said, in the southern part of the state, totally different story. You know, they're just not used to dealing with bear, and, and it's uh, more of an event and, and sometimes more concerning, um, you know, for somebody uh, that sees a bear. So this is a video. Hopefully this will play. Oh, maybe it won't. I don't think it's going to play. But basically what this video is... There you go. I can't do that. <laughs> ah, bummer. Basically, this is probably one of the most common complaints that we deal with. A bear um, coming in, hitting a garbage can, a bird feeder. Um, this video is just basically the bear knocking the garbage can over, but this is what we're dealing with. Does anybody notice anything in particular about this video? Yep, go ahead. There's snow on the ground. Exactly, snow on the ground. So we're, we're getting close to this time period right now. This was probably in March. Um, you know, so we're coming up on this. You know, bears are, are obviously getting more active as the weather warms up. And of course, that's a time where we try to put messages out and alert people. Now's the time to put those garbage cans inside the garage if you can, take down your bird feeders, you know, make sure your grill's clean and stuff. So we're, we're quickly approaching this time period when we see the majority of calls coming in. You know, it's that springtime when, yeah, bears are hungry. You know, they, they just spent all winter um, low activity and, and not eating much. And, you know, now it's time to replenish those, those reserves. So we're, we're quickly coming up on this time period. And of course, this is what it looks like afterwards, right? You know, if you're a homeowner, last thing you want to do is go out there in the morning and, and pick up your trash, you know, that's scattered all around the yard. So, you know, attractant management, that's the big thing. Um, you know, making sure that these attractants are, are put away and inaccessible to bear, because like Randy had mentioned, bear are smart, you know, have long memories. If, if they get a reward, if, if they come back, you know, um, and they occasionally get a, a garbage can like this, they're going to keep coming back and coming back and coming back. So the key is put those attractants away and make sure they're inaccessible. So what, what do we do when we get these complaints? 
Um, there's a number of, of different things that we do to provide assistance you know, to, to folks that are dealing with nuisance bear issues. First one's technical assistance. Um, 60 to 70% of our complaints every year are technical assistance. And what's technical assistance? That's just providing guidance, providing a, advice to that homeowner on what to do. A lot of times, like I said, it's bird feeders, it's putting the, the grills away, um, not feeding pets outside, um, you know, removing those attractants. Um, for the more serious or, or more serious cases where, um, you know, maybe it's a bear that, that's coming, uh, um, coming in daylight activity, uh, showing a little aggression or not showing any fear of humans, you know, we, we may then do trap and relocation. Um, Wildlife Services does all our trapping and relocating. For nuisance situations last year, I think they trapped 130 bear. So they'll set a culvert style trap. Um, you can see a, a photo of it in the bottom uh, right there. Um, culvert style trap, you know, it's baited. That bear will come in there and, and then once they trap it, they'll move it at least a minimum of 20 miles away and release it. Um, public loves it, or, or I shouldn't say loves it, supports it. Um, you know, it's a non-lethal method and, and obviously if we can, um, you know, resolve the conflict non-lethally, you know, most people support that as well. But yeah, 130 bear are trapped and relocated each year just in, in response to uh, nuisance conflicts. Uh, trapping and euthanizing or shooting permits. Um, for a nuisance situations, very seldom do we have to euthanize a bear. Um, typically, if we have to euthanize a bear, it's because that bear is highly habituated, um, doesn't have any fear of humans, shows aggression. And a lot of times that's a result of people feeding bear or, or you know, giving the bear a handout. Um, you know, just like any domestic animal or, or any wild animal, you know, you feed that animal, it, it's gonna keep coming back for that reward, that food reward. And oftentimes, you know, um, the motto is a fed bear is a dead bear. And that's true in some cases because these bear will get, you know, super habituated to humans, no, um, have no fear. And then in, in a lot of cases, you know, that bear needs to be euthanized because it no longer, um, you know, no longer has that fear. But there's um, probably less than a half a dozen bear euthanized every year in response to nuisance or even agricultural damage conflicts. It, it just doesn't happen that often. Um, bear shooting permits. You know, we have the ability to uh, issue shooting permits to landowners to allow them to shoot bear outside of the regular bear hunting season. On nuisance situations, we don't do that very often. Um, I think last year there was five permits issued for nuisance situations. Most of those were uh, cabin break-ins where bears were breaking in the cabins. Um, or um, one of the newer things that's happening now is some of these bigger sugar bush operations where they're making maple syrup. The bear will come in and they'll chew on the... The, the sap lines, um, you know, and cause a lot of damage that way. It doesn't qualify for agricultural damage program, but will assist, you know, with a shooting permit or even trapping and, and relocation in those situations. But those are our primary um, methods that we use. Like I said, the big one, education. You know, 60 to 70% of, of calls or, or complaints we can, we can respond to with just educating, you know, providing information and guidance to those homeowners that are, that are dealing with that conflict. So our agricultural program, um, in, in Wisconsin, we have the Wildlife Damage Abatement and Claims Program. Uh, that program helps commercial agricultural producers uh, deal with problems from deer, bear, elk, turkey, geese, and cougar. Fortunately, we've never had any cougar issues, but cougar are on there. Um, you know, so, so we have that program, and that program provides damage abatement assistance and then also compensation for, for damages from bear. Um, you can see that field there. I'm not sure if anyone has an agricultural background, but all those little holes in those, those are corn fields. All those little holes are areas of bear damage where a bear have gone in that field and, and caused that damage. Um, that typically happens when that corn's entering the milk stage. Um, that's typically in, in um, late July, August, um, typically in August, prior to the start of the bear hunting season. So that's an important point because it's, it's you know, a lot of people will say, well, why don't you try to um, address conflict with bear, bear hunting or bear hunters? And, and we do with, with quotas, but at these site-specific levels, this damage is happening prior to the bear hunting season, so we need other, um, other tools or other options for addressing those conflicts. Um, the other type of damage that we, we deal with is apiaries. Apiaries are beehives, and they can be used for pollination purposes or they can be used for honey production. Um, you know, a lot of cases for apiaries, and I'll have a couple slides here, but we, we put electric fencing around those apiaries. And 
Uh, the program, at least as, as of writing the um, bear management plan in 2019, at that point we had over uh, 700 um, electric fences out on the landscape to protect apiaries. You know, that was three years ago. My guess is now we're probably around 900 to 1,000 um, fences out there on the landscape for apiaries. Um, the other one is livestock depredation. So this program provides compensation for livestock depredations that occur. Doesn't happen very frequently, but it does happen every year. Um, four or five depredations per year, probably for livestock. Uh, you know, in that case, like I said, um, our other policy is that a, a depredating bear is a dead bear. So typically if we have a depredation situation, uh, in a lot of cases those bear will come back, um, you know, to, to look at for other livestock, um, but we either trap and euthanize that bear or um, issue a shooting permit to the landowner and, and hopefully they can remove it that way. So our enrollments in the bear damage program, uh, we separate these as well. So the blue is, is our standard crop enrollments. So typically those are corn, you know, people that are having corn damage. Um, and the red up there, sorry, I have that backwards. The red is the, the corn damage or, or, or standard enrollments. And then the blue is the apiary. So those people that enroll for, for, um, for beehive or, or honey production type purposes. So you can see, you know, about 260 enrollments uh, every year for, for bear damage or bear conflict related issues. Uh, so what do we do for on the agricultural side of things for, for damage? Uh, we have these, these methods here, it's typically what we incorporate. And I'll go through each one of these individually. So these farm plans, we just implemented these probably five years ago now. So basically we have this long history of working with certain producers around the state that, that have you know, corn damage year after year. So what we began doing five years ago is we would proactively meet with that farmer, identify those fields that were gonna be corn, planted in corn, and then we would proactively have abatement strategy in place. That abatement strategy could, a strategy could be trapping and relocation, it could be a shooting permit, or if it's an area that typically didn't get significant damage, it may be do nothing. You know, so, um, so we proactively identify where we're gonna place traps based off of what damage occurred in the past and proactively um, you know, have fields identified or locations identified where we're gonna issue a shooting permit once damage occurs. And this has worked really well. Um, our bear trappers, our wildlife services bear trappers, um, having these pl plans in place provides a lot of efficiency for them so they can respond quickly when, when bear damage occurs because it, it is a short window when it occurs, but when, when that corn hits that milk stage, those bear are in there and they can do some significant damage in just a matter of weeks. Uh, the other thing is hunting, public hunting. So any property or, or any, with the exception of apiaries, any property where we're providing damage abatement assistance or compensation through the program, it's required to be open to the public for hunting. That's through state statute. So under state law, that property needs to be open to the public. And we post all those properties on the DNR website. So if you're a bear hunter, you draw a class A bear harvest tag, you can go to this website. Let's look at the list of farmers by zone that have those that are enrolled in the program and, and potentially get hunting access to those properties. Temporary fencing, I alluded to this before. Uh, we have probably seven to 800 temporary fences out on the landscape primarily for you know, apiaries, beehives. Um, we'll also put them around silage bags sometimes, but um, super effective um, technique for, for preventing bear damage. Um, a lot of times when, when um, our damage specialists put, put these fences up, sometimes they'll put peanut butter or molasses or something on that fence. And then what that does is that gets the bear to touch it with their nose or their tongue and it, it gives them you know, that, negative, um, that negative reinforcement of that shock. You know? so, um, the one thing is, you know, you have to make sure these fences are functioning, very good grounding rods, make sure the voltage is correct that's going, going through them, but super effective way to, um, to prevent um, bear damage. Uh, a few years ago, our Natural Resources Board asked why we don't fence, um, put electric fences around cornfields, you know, because it is effective. Um, the reason we don't is one, is it's labor intensive, and then two, you always have issues with, with sh you know, fences shorting out or, um, you know, branches falling on them, whatever. But we did, as, as just as a demonstration, we did uh, that year fence three different uh, corn fields. They were smaller in, in size from three acres to five acres. And um, um, we were able to, to eliminate the bear damage in those fields probably by 95%. 
I mean, super effective. The, the little bit of bear damage that we did have in those fields was where um, there was a little dip in the topo topography and a bear was able to go under that bottom wire and get in there. But otherwise, it, it prevented bear damage 100%. But on a large scale, when you're talking about a 40, 60, 80 acre cornfield, it's just not practical to put electric fencing around that, that large of a, um, um, of a field. And then you always have issues with deer potentially um, tearing that fence down as well. But super effective. Um, you know, I, I had some, some beehives on our property this year. Uh, I proactively put the temporary or uh, electric fencing around it, didn't have a problem at all with bear. And we could see on several occasions, it's pretty sandy where I live, and at several occasions you could come up there and you could see where the bear had kind of tested the fence, but it, it worked, it kept them out and, and uh, no damage. So trapping and relocation, this is our primary abatement method for, um, for agricultural situations. One, it's non-lethal. And two, as Randy mentioned, depending on what bear management zone you, you hunt in, it's anywhere from one year up to 12 years right now to wait for a harvest tag. So by, by moving these bear, putting them out on the landscape, making them available, it, it takes away some of those social pressures of having to kill or, or um, you know, um, lethally remove bear through shooting permits or through trapping and, and, and even euthanizing bear. So it's, it's more publicly acceptable. Um, the research that has been done, uh, there's only a 4% recapture rate. Um, so, um, you know, it appears to be a, a pretty effective. However, we do want to conduct some research to see exactly what happens to these bear after we move them. You know, we know we're not recapturing them or we're only recapturing approximately 4%, but where, where are they going? Are they going you know, to different cornfields? Are, are they, you know, um, moving other, other areas? You know, what's, what exactly is happening to them? And hopefully at some point we'll be able to do that research. But um, for agricultural situations, um, depending on the year, we'll move four or 500 bear a year. Um, you know, we're covering large acreages a lot of times. You know, some of the farms that are enrolled are, you know, 1,000 or 1,500 acres. So we're, we're protecting a lot of crop out there. And, and um, the, the counties that we primarily are, or that has um, the most amount of bears moved are typically Rusk and Sawyer County. Um, although recent years, it seems like we're getting more in Washburn County, um, you know, Barron County, kind of that area as well. But, um, and, and that's one of the reasons Randy didn't mention it, but zone D, uh, several years ago with the bear management plan, we did change the zone configurations. And zone D was, um, the boundaries was altered to target the conflicts, the bear conflicts that we were having in that area. One, nuisance complaints, but then it, agricultural damage. So even through our bear management plan and our hunting structure, you know, we, we try to target some of these conflict sites. So this is what I was referring to, the number of bears trapped and relocated in response to agricultural conflicts. You know, last year, 437 bear. Um, probably, I don't remember the exact percentage, but probably 70% of those were in Ruskin and Sawyer County. So pretty, um, not quite sure exactly what's happening there because that's an awful lot of bear to be trapping from, from two counties. Shooting permits is, is kind of our last resort. You know, um, historically, um, you know, we didn't, um, rely on shooting permits very often. We, we do use them a little bit more now, you know, and the problem with shooting permits is obviously to be effective, that hunter needs to be out there um, when the bear are there. You know, you, you can't just hunt on the weekends, you know, you just can't hunt after work, you know, you, you gotta be there. And that's the advantage of, of trapping relocation as well, is that traps on the landscape 24 hours a day, you know, and, and, um, and, and accessible and working, you know, we're shooting permits, you know, it's up to the hunter, up to the farmer, how, um, you know, how active they are on those shooting permits. But last year, you can see uh, 51 shooting, or 30 shooting permits issued with 51 bear harvested. A couple of years ago, 2020, you know, 128 bear harvested. You know, so, um, and this is a, a, a direct correlation, a little bit of the bear population and probably um, the crop year, how well that corn's doing in the different maturity levels, but a lot of that's due to how active those farmers are in, in actually using those shooting permits. Uh, and the last thing here, um, you know, for agricultural is just, you know, like I said, the, the program does provide compensation. So prior to 10 days, or 10 days prior to harvesting the crop, we actually have damage technicians that go out there and act, conduct actual crop appraisals. So they'll walk the entire field, they'll look for those you know, little donut holes of damage, and they add those all up, and then they'll do um, yield calculations on, on the undamaged parts, and then that gives us an estimate of, of um, the amount of bear damage that was done in those fields. 
So if you add all that up, you know, last year or 2021 claims claims for 22 are just coming in right now, but uh, 2021 we had roughly $137,000 in appraised bear damages across the state. So um, fair fair amount, but um, you know, you, you look at um, the amount of, of acreage and, and the amount of um, total value of crops that we're protecting. That's that's a pretty small amount. Um, some farmers that, that we work with, you know, we're protecting 800 to a million dollars worth of crops, you know, so um, overall the program is, is pretty darn efficient and does a good job of, of preventing damages. So how can you be a good neighbor to bears? Don't feed them. <laughs> you know, fed bear is a dead bear. We don't want bears to be habituated. Habituated bears, you know, you might like it, but your neighbor may not like it. And, and if that bear, you know, visits different people in that neighborhood, of course, it's going to cause problems. And at some point, it's, it's, you know, it'll get reported to us. And then, you know, if it's too habituated, unfortunately, a lot of times that bear needs to be euthanized. So don't feed bears. Remove attractants. Um, as we discussed this time of year, um, or within probably the next month, you know, start thinking about that. Start thinking about, you know, your bird feeders, taking those down making sure your grills are clean of, of residue, um, putting garbage cans in, that type of stuff. Um, I'm guilty, I'll admit, like almost every spring, our garbage can gets hit. You know, it, I leave it out, leave it out, leave it out, finally it gets hit, and, and it's like, I need to put that in, you know. But I put it in, and I don't have any more problems. Um, you know, and, and that's the key, making sure that there's not a reward there for that bear if, if they do decide to come back. The last thing is help is available, right? So if you have a bear problem that you can't resolve, um, aggressive bear, um, you know, something that you need assistance, there is help. We partner with USDA Wildlife Services, give them a call. Um, they'll come out there, they'll do a site visit if, if it's warranted and, and um, you know, potentially trap and relocate that bear or at least provide some assistance to make sure that we can resolve that conflict for you. Um, so with that, that's all we have and I wanted to leave plenty of time for questions. So folks on YouTube, if you have any questions, just put them in the chat and we'll try to address them. Question? So you mentioned that a bear's diet is really variable, but has there ever been cases of like nutrient deficiency? Well, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, speaking about bear diets and if there's ever been cases of nutrient deficiency, um, it's a good question. I'm sure there have somewhere along the way, but bears are so adaptable in their diet. They'll eat just about anything. And so as they go throughout the course of the year, the way I like to think about it is they're eating 12 months of food in six months because they're sleeping the other six, right? So they got to eat a year's worth of food in six months. And so they're really adaptable in their diet and they'll take advantage of whatever's out there. So very rarely do bears starve to death in the den. That's something, you know, we've seen through den assessments and things like that. But, you know, I'm sure there's cases out there, but I don't think it's a common occurrence. We made it to question number two before cocaine bear came up. So, I, <laughs> No, it's a good question. So yeah, about this movie that's coming out, the cocaine bear, that's probably right at the top of the list of weird things. Brad, you might have some good ones too, but um, I'm interested to see this movie. I, I know that they've, the, the, it's based on a true story. I'm told it, a bear was found dead having consumed it. So it died very quickly. Um, it did not go on a cocaine fueled rampage, but that makes a much better movie, I hope. I don't know if you have any. No, I you know, don't have anything <laughs> to add to that. But, top of the list. You know, yeah, <laughs> weird things happen all the time. You guys have probably seen YouTube videos where they'll get like a, you know, um, a Cheeto ball jar caught on their heads and stuff like that. So, yeah, they, they eat pretty much everything. Like Randy said, they're yeah. opportunistic and they'll, they'll try anything. Do you see maple syrup being added to your date night plans? 
I don't. Um, the question was, do we see maple syrup uh, being added to the wildlife damage abatement claims program? Um, I don't. Um, that, that would be a legislative um, change. Um, yeah, the department doesn't have the ability just to add different crop types that would have to come through the state legislature. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so the, the question is how, how far is there a magic number of, of where we take bears and, and do we get uh, multiple captures or recaptures? Um, so our, our policy is a minimum of 20 miles. Um, so that's a minimum. A lot of bears will take a lot further than that. And we take, I, I didn't mention it during the presentation, but where we re release bears, it's all public land, large tracts of, of forested public land. Uh, we try to get them away from agriculture. We try to get them away from residential areas as, as much as possible. So we release them all on, on public land um, at least 20 miles away. Um, the research that has been done, we used to have a three strike policy, a nuisance bear where um, on the initial complaint, we would ear tag a nuisance bear. And then if we captured it three times, um, then that bear would be euthanized. Um, so those recapture rates for those nuisance bear, there was not a high level of recaptures on those nuisance bear. They, they did happen, but not a high level. And then like I had mentioned during my presentation, um, the, the recapture of, of agricultural bears or bears moved in response to agricultural was only 4%. So um, no, we're not seeing cases where we're, we're um, capturing you know, the same bear multiple times, at least not very frequently. Yeah, so the question was, you know, we, we see a number of conflicts, you know, seven, 800 conflicts each year. Are we expecting that number to go up or down? Um, we're hoping that number is going to go down. Um, recent years, we've um, really tried to invest in more outreach. Um, so last year, Randy and I, we had a, a webinar, um, you know, where we provided a bunch of information and went through a lot of the same conflict information you heard today. So through that, um, we are also, um, you know, put out Facebook and, and social media type press releases, you know, to, to create awareness there. Um, Wisconsin just bought into the BearWise program last year. The BearWise program is, is a, um, a nationwide program that, that has educational materials that we can draw from and distribute or, or use, utilize around the state. So we're hoping that number goes down as, as we, we, you know, increase our outreach efforts. Um, yeah, hopefully we can educate people to, to be proactive and resolve conflicts before they happen. Many, or how often are people injured by bears during the season? Yeah, so how often are people injured? Um, probably, I would say once, twice a year, maybe. Yep. Yeah, it's not, it's not very often. We, we do have, um, I keep personal records of, of you know, those uh, physical contact between, you know, humans and bears, and it's, it's very seldom. Because a lot of times it, it seems to be cases where, um, you know, a pet or a dog engages with a bear, that individual tries to intervene and, and break it up, and then there's some physical contact there. Um, you know, so, so very seldom does it happen, and certainly very seldom to the point where someone gets, um, you know, really injured significantly or, or um, critically. Um, but yeah, there is contact that does occur on occasion. Sounds like my question. So the question is, why do hunters need to use the aid of dogs or the aid of bait in hunting? Um, again, the first thing is, is that's that's part of the state statute that lays out um, the bear program, and those are are both in their own ways very controversial among some groups. Um, you know, bears are pretty hard to find, right? They're out in the woods, but it's not like deer hunting necessarily, where you can just go out and watch for them and they're up and moving around. So the idea is, these are two methods that obviously help hunters be successful. Um, they're methods that are allowed in a variety of other states. Some states have one or both or neither. Um, those regulations vary all over. Um, but it basically comes down to that's, that's what's in law. Um, you know, there's a culture around it. Um, but it, it obviously helps eventually be successful. Um, you know, without them, I think we would 
really struggle to harvest as many bears as we can and do in the state. Um, but th like, like I said, that doesn't mean that they, they go without controversy. How do you feel about the ethnic cleansing of the exchange? Uh, personal questions. <laughs> uh, question is, how do I feel personally? I mean, at the end of the day, frankly, my personal opinion really doesn't matter. As, as a you know, state agent, state employee, right, I'm going to implement the law. Um, I do think sometimes these, these methods get a bad rap, right? I've, I've been out with people. We do a, a big push for like hunter education, hunter ethics. And I think the vast majority of people that are out there doing these things are, you know, acting in ethical ways. Um, certainly everybody's entitled to their own opinion and that's just the way it is. But um, I think most people are doing it, you know, in a positive way. In fact, I didn't include it in this slide, but I, I have a slide, part of that, that public, um, research we do kind of asks uh, hunter motivations. Why do you bear hunt, right? And a lot of it comes down to, you know, being outside in nature. They want to participate with family and friends. They want to work with their dogs. Um, I think about fourth or fifth on the list is to shoot a, a trophy size bear, right? And so the primary motivation is actually a lot around the activity and working with people and being outside and not necessarily to get a bear. Nope. All we can do for questions at the moment. So if you want to ask more, if you want to chat with Brad and Randy more, we're going to move out into the lobby. So I'm going to have you guys go out Sounds there. Sounds good. And if you want to ask more questions, please do. And then the SAF people can come on in. <laughs> I can hear them all there. We're good.